Ideas have consequences, but so does silence, insists Melissa Chen, the New York editor for The Spectator and managing director of Ideas Beyond Borders, a nonprofit that translates new and classic texts about science, history, and liberal political philosophy into Arabic and then distributes them free as ebooks throughout the Middle East. Born and raised in Singapore, Chen came to the United States a little bit more than a decade ago to study genomics at Boston University. She quickly established herself as a foe of groupthink, political correctness, and cancel culture in America while critiquing authoritarian regimes in China, her birth country, and elsewhere. A frequent guest on shows and podcasts such as The Joe Rogan Experience, Bridget Fetessy's Walk-In's Welcome, and The Rubin Report, Chen maintains one of the liveliest feeds on Twitter, mixing long threads with sardonic comments on the news of the day. Chen talks with me today about how an obsessive focus on identity politics led the media to keep insisting, without evidence, that the murder of massage parlor workers in Atlanta was a hate crime against Asian Americans, why Hollywood is changing its products to please censors in the Chinese government, and how the best way to counter radicalization is with speech and information rather than repression. Melissa Chen, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you, Nick, for having me on. Let's get right to it. Uh, You have one of the best Twitter feeds in existence. Your most recent tweet as of this taping was, I'd like to welcome the Arabs to the Schrodinger's White People's Club, signed Asians and Jews. What what do you mean by that? Uh, Unpack that for me. Okay. So, well, you know, um, the Jews were probably the first ones to join the club. Um, many years ago, um, you know, during, our, I guess, like right after the war, uh, there were all these like college admission practices where they were trying to keep the Jews out and they had quotas. So, you know, Jews were, you know, considered people of color. They were marginalized identities. But along the way, you know, they became one of the most successful immigrant groups and have now are now considered white. Um, and it's the same thing with Asian Americans. Asian Americans have, you know, in the same way, kind of crossed that Rubicon. And uh, <laughs> well, today, what happened was, you know, there was um, unfortunately just another shooting in America. Ten people were killed, and you know, of course, you had a lot of people kind of jumping to conclusions. There were like ro- low resolution images of the shooter, and people assumed he was white. Um, a lot of uh, sort of our media class was, you know, they were tweeting about how the very fact that this guy was taken into custody alive uh, proves that he was white. It was just another white shooter in America. And of course, it turned out, um, you know, that he was actually a Muslim American. He had a very, you know, visibly Muslim name. Um, more details came out. He turns out to be Syrian. And so <laughs> there were people trying to, you know, kind of uh, move the goalposts then instead of saying, you know, I was wrong about this, um, shouldn't jump to conclusions, then it became, well, he had white privilege because he he looks white. Arabs are white and therefore he would, you know, this is why he was still taken into custody, he wasn't shot like he would have been if he was a, you know, a, a black American. If I'm assuming if the Arabs are now joining the Jews as honorary whites, the Jews are going to want to recount or something like that? Perhaps, yeah. But there is this concept where the, the, the concept of whiteness is is, flu, flu, is very fluid. You had a, a ridiculous headline in the New York Times um, a few months ago about this concept of multiracial whiteness. This was after the elections, right? And, and it, you know, the, one of the shocking things about the 2020 elections was actually Trump seemed to increase his lead among um, certain minority groups. And that that was a bit of a shock. And so, you know, you have people kind of talking about this concept of, of multiracial whiteness because whiteness is, is such a fluid construct. Basically, you know, whoever they want to paint in power is, is now considered under this umbrella. And so, you know, that was what I was poking fun at because Asian Americans, you know, with especially how, how they have performed as, as a, um, as a demographic in, in, in academia um, and also just in, if looking at income, like, you know, median wage, for example. And uh, Schrodinger, of course, is the what uh, physicist who came up with the idea of, you know, the, the famous example of a cat being dead and alive at the same time. And I know I've, I've used it a lot, the great uh, Schrodinger's immigrant who is both lazy and comes here to take uh, welfare, 
or is super energetic and comes here to steal our jobs. Like they can be both, it's undecidable. They can be both at the same time, right? Exactly. And that's what we mean by using these identity groups as as pawns in, in the larger culture war. And we're seeing a lot of that now with Asian Americans, because on the one hand, you have universities, you know, this debate about universities discriminating against Asians. And on the other, suddenly they become minorities when when it's very useful to the to the narrative. You've written and tweeted a lot about the um, the impulse among many people to say that the mass shooting or, or spree killing, I guess, might be a more technical term for it in Atlanta, where you know a a, a man went and shot eight people, uh, six of whom were Asian of Asian descent, um, and that was immediately put into a framework that this is part of a massive increase in hate crimes against Asians. Um, it turns out that that may not at all be the motivation of the um, of the shooter. What, you know, you, you were one of the first people I saw in press saying, you know, what we really need to kind of think about this and uh, think about what the motive is. What was your, you know, um, why were you so attuned to that? Um, and why is it, you know, why is it important that we don't jump to conclusions about why mass killers do what they do? Well, it's not just mass killers. Um, you know, I said the same thing when previous, uh, you know, like sort of previous to this incident that kind of like rose to the national consciousness, were a lot of incidents that were happening in some cities like Oakland, San Francisco, New York, because there were actually video surveillance captured of some assaults and attacks of mostly elderly Asians. Um, and they were, you know, perpetrated by, you know, quite clearly people that were not white. And even under those circumstances, people were calling that, you know, some you had some conservative outlets calling it black on Asian crime. And I never saw that framing as useful um, because the, it implies something, you know, it's you're implying a, a certain racial motivation. And even under those situations, I said, you know, I, I did tweet that we should actually hold back. And, you know, it turns out the DA, like Chesa Budin, they did not bring any hate charges yet. And even under those circumstances, I said, we should just wait for, you know, these people to be investigated, have their trial play out, figure out if racial motivation really is, is the reason for this, because ambient crime levels have been increasing across the board. And this is, you know, post COVID lockdowns, um, economic stagnation. Um, and also you have the confluence of, of I guess, government ineptitude, um, there's a, a trend where in, in some of these progressive cities where cops have been very reluctant to prosecute. So a lot of these factors have kind of come together and it's caused crime in general to skyrocket. And so before we jump the gun to say that this is anything to do with, you know, a rise in Asian targeted crime, I, I think it behooves us to see if that really is the motivation, um, you know, through investigations, through interviews with the perpetrators, um, because to make this claim is 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 very serious charge, um, and you have a press basically that's very eager to link Trump's rhetoric, you know, saying that because of uh, he's been very, um, you know, saying things like kung flu or um, the China virus that this is causing people. There's a direct line between Trump saying these things, and and you know, causing people to actually act in a way that's violent towards Asians, and I think that's very dangerous and. It has not been proven, and moreover, the very fact that this is happening in, um, you know, the cities that are didn't didn't vote for him by a long shot um, is is you know it doesn't seem like a plausible explanation to me. Um, you know, it's one of the studies that came out, uh, and I think it was released just a day or two before the shooting, um, but it, it purported to show a 150 percent increase in two in 2020 over 2019 in uh, hate crimes against Asians. Um, and, you know, one of the things is that when you looked at the actual numbers, it it seemed like there was less going on than people, you know, were drawing from the, the, the kind of headline conclusion. So in New York City uh, in 2019, they counted three hate crimes in, uh, and then it was something like 23 or 28 in 2020. And, you know, when you're talking about a city of eight million, I mean, obviously any of these crimes, any, any hate crime is one too many, but we're not talking about thousands or tens of thousands of incidents. Um, what I mean, you know, it, it's it's an interesting 
I guess, kind of conundrum for Asian Americans. And I, I even bristled, you know, using that phrase because I grew up on the East Coast and I didn't remember people ever saying Asian American. It was much, it was always in the same way that Europeans were never called like Europeans or whites or Anglo. It was always Irish American, Italian American, Jewish American. It was Korean, Japanese, Chinese, whatever, you know, the particular ethnicity of the person. Um, but you know, the Asian American, uh, you know, now seems to um, struggle under the, rubric, or, you know, the moniker of a, of a model minority. Is that, um, you know, is that what gives rise to a, a need among Asian Americans to say, hey, we are, um, you know, we're also oppressed, we're also exploited? What do, what do you think is going on there? Well, I think many Asian Americans are, you know, at this point, the ones that are highly educated. Um, there is a certain set of beliefs that are, you know, that are sort of touted in, in this particular class, the people that go to Ivy League schools, for example. Um, and, you know, to, to remain on, on that cocktail circuit, you know, to um, be invited into this particular social networks where people are going to Aspen Institutes and all these like fancy places. Um, very dominant narrative is is um, critical race theory, and and part of critical race theory necessarily involves the rejection of the model minority myth. They keep calling it the myth um, because everything is about power and pitting groups against each other, and that's how they view this. That because Asian Americans can be celebrated as a class, as a as a demographic, um, it puts other demographics down. And it's it's a bit of a, an equity kind of um, explanation. So, you know, because of the implication that, okay, if to celebrate this minority group success means that mm, you're saying that other minority groups could do better. Um, and, and that is something that that is completely frowned upon that is, you know, um, you shouldn't be pitting these groups against each other. So that's really kind of where um, the, the rejection of, of that myth comes from. And, and, and ironically, you know, coming from the, the class of Asians that are highly educated, that went to these very schools that, you know, um, kind of got in in spite of affirmative action. Um, and I just actually want to circle back on something else that you said about you know, you're comparing the statistic of 150% increase in, in, in hate crimes, um, just preliminary police data. Um, the thing is the FBI doesn't collect um, hate crime statistics till November. So for the last year, you know, if we want statistics uh, from 2020, we'll only get it in November of this year. So th that data that you're quoting actually um, is just preliminary. And, and it's only been studied in 16 cities across the United States. And so that 150% comes from there. Now, there was another group that came out um, and because they wanted to track um, hate incidents um, in 2020, because this is the year of COVID lockdown, Donald Trump. And, and you had this activist group. It was a new advocacy group called Stop AAPI Hate. Shows up around last year, early last year. And they basically built a portal a web portal where people can go and, and submit self-report. I've just experienced a hate crime, log where it happened, you know, kind of describe the incident, categorize the incident and submit. Um, and so for a while you were seeing almost throughout 2020, a statistic that was um, sort of everywhere, quoted everywhere in the press. Almost every article talked about the surge in anti-Asian anti American, Asian American hate. Um, it seemed like there was you know, in 1900%, it was like a thousand, you know, and, and it, till today, so about one year's worth of collection, there has been 3,800 um, hate incidents. And this sounds terrible. Like, this is like, you know, it's it, like one hate incident is enough, is enough, but now you have 3,800 incidents. Um, but then you kind of like look a little closer at the data and you realize, number one, this is not coming from official police data. This is actually self-reporting. Anyone can log on and self-report. Number two, um, this data was actually also cat categorized to show that actually majority of this wasn't even violent. It wasn't even a physical incident. We're talking about verbal um, incidents. We're talking about shunning, like 20% of the, the case, the hate incidents were actually shunning. So if you've been creating, if you've been kind of fanning these 
these flames and, and getting Asian Americans to think that people are out to get them. You know, you're walking in a supermarket and somebody gives you a stare. You might log that as a shunning incident, you know, or, or you know, this uh, hostess at a restaurant didn't want to serve me. Could be for any reason, but there's a bit of confirmation bias going on now because you're actually looking for it. That's why this narrative is, is dangerous. And, and when the media was uncritically parroting this statistic everywhere, quoting this advocacy group that, you know, sprouted out of nowhere just one year ago, um, I, I expected the media to at least be, you know, at least put some context, at least mention that in, in the pieces. But we saw none of that. And, and, you know, by October, you had the United Nations writing a report, excoriating Donald Trump for his rhetoric, and then, you know, putting in the report this exact statistic from the same group. And all of a sudden, the next thing you know, the next iteration of the news cycle became um, the UN says that Asian American hate crimes have increased, blah, blah, blah. And this comes on the heels of Donald Trump's rhetoric. So now it has the credibility and of, of the United Nations. And it's just been quoted as a United Nations Which report. may mean that it has no credibility at all, right? I mean, that's the okay. upside. But yeah, that's, that's an amazing... Um, you know, kind of story or, or thumbnail of of how data or factoids, you know, things that have the shape of facts get cir get created and circulated. Right. But I'm not doubting that there might be an increase in, in um, you know, hate crimes against Asian. But, but, you know, the question is really, is it meaningful? And has it been tied to Trump's rhetoric? And it really looks like the for the latter question, no. Whether it's meaningful, we really need to wait till November 2021 to, to see whether it is a meaningful rise. What has been your experience? And I realize, you know, uh, you, you are trained as a scientist, um, you know, and so I realize that anecdote isn't data. But I saw, again, on Twitter, um, you and Wesley Yang, who's uh, somebody who I uh, interviewed here, uh, I don't know, like a year and a half ago or whatever, whose book, The Souls of Yellow Folk, are, is just a fantastic uh, meditation on all sorts of things, including class and race and ethnicity in America. But um, both of you seem to be saying on Twitter that you have not felt, you know, a particular spike because I've seen a lot of, of people of Asian descent saying, you know, yeah, this past year has been pretty rough. Um, has but your experience really has not been that? No, not at all. Um, but again, I, I I do think you know in part when you're primed to to feel a certain way, um, you you can you know interpret a lot of incidents as as you know some sort of that has animosity when when it might not have any. Um, but there's a lot of public sharing about these kinds of like it's almost like public therapy, like collective therapy, where people share, you know, the, there are these tweets that get that get thousands of you know retweets and likes um, about incidents. Like I was at a grocery store and you know this happened, or, or I'm driving around and somebody flashes a white power sign, and um, you know which it, may or may not be a white power sign, right? It, so it, I mean it, the it, the okay it, it kind of yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, for, for Wesley and I, like one of the things we were talking about how also is that um, when incidents like that happen, all of a sudden you have, you know, white friends or something checking in with you and asking, um, how, how are you? Just do you want to talk about something? And, you know, it's one of those things where I almost that makes me feel more Asian than I've ever felt by checking in with me after an incident like that. It's like, oh, right. Yeah, I'm I'm Asian. <laughs> you know, how do you conceive of um it's kind of a weird question, but how do you conceive of Asian? I mean, is that a meaningful category to you or or uh, yeah, or do you see yourself? I mean, you're originally from Singapore. I mean, do you see yourself more as Singaporean? Like I, I don't and I realize this is embedded in the rhetoric of, you know, white supremacy or of whiteness as universal. I don't think of myself as white. If I think of myself in terms of ethnicity, I think of, you know, I'm Irish American or Italian American. I don't think I'm European. Uh, but I mean, do you see Asian? Is that like something that's very big in your head or is it something different? So I conceive of myself as Asian the way Kamel conceives himself as black, which mm -hmm. is Camille Foster, Camille Foster, which yeah. is this is a fiction. Um, and, you know, in part growing up in Singapore, um, helped to kind of feed that view because, you know, 75% of Singaporeans are Han Chinese, but we've never 
you know, kind of identified with with Han Chinese because to create, uh, you know, a very diverse um, country out of four different races, four different religions, you had Malays who are Muslim, Indians who are mostly Hindu, Chinese who are mostly Buddhist, and then you, you also had Christians, Christians usually Eurasians because there was a lot of intermixing. Um, and, and to, you know, stuff these four groups, demographics, into a city that is 360 kilometers squared, you know, in terms of area, you know, it's basically four times the size of Manhattan. Just multiply Manhattan four times, that's the size of Singapore. So you're, you're basically stuffing, you know, four million, five million of these people of all these different races and religion into, into a size that's basically four times Manhattan. And, and it's, it's a powder keg, right, especially as a young nation. So you know, the founder of Singapore was was very careful to to, you know, kind of elevate national identity because that's how you get people to put aside their differences. And so the Singaporean identity was was created. You know, we speak um, actually uh, like a syncretic blend of all four languages that's that creates um, like a, a language called Singlish, which is kind of a mix of everything. And so you have a very distinct identity that was separate from where all these immigrant groups came from. And in many ways, I think it's, you know, kind of similar in America, right? Like we have an American identity. It's, it's, um, it's e pluribus unum, right? Like from many one, and you create this like one identity, there are these principles and values, and we, we kind of instinctively get what it means to be American. And um, I think it's the same way in Singapore. So it was always clear to me that you know, that there was no, um, like, what, what is Asian? Like, firstly, it's a, it's a continent. I mean, my, my, you know, my co-founder, Faisal, he's Iraqi, he's Asian too, he's from the same continent, but we, you know, uh, the cultures and backgrounds couldn't be more different. So in a way, I, I do see it like the way Kamel sees it. It's a, a fiction and it's, it's really meaningless as, as a category. But being Singaporean matters to you, doesn't it, on some level? Um, I mean, it's just where I was born. It's the accident of accident of birth, um, you know, okay. and and the values. What what are the values? What would you say are, um, you know, the the values that are promoted in a Singaporean identity? Um, very similar to the United States. Uh, you know, the idea of meritocracy is very important. Um, it's almost enshrined in in our national pledge, because um, you know, again, it's it's you either have something merit based or you have something that is. You know, you deserve things because uh, either aristocracy or identity, um, and and the only way to kind of make things fair and and ensure that people have equal opportunity is to set up a system where you know you have a meritocracy. Um, I would say also Confucian values are are very um, uh, elevated in. in so the what nationals. what does that mean? Um, what are Confucian values? Confucian values um, in the sense of, you know, hierarchies are, are kind of natural. Um, you, you know, the nuclear family um, is, is very important. Always respect your elders. Um, it's, it's more communitarian. So, you know, things like um, you, you, social harmony is kind of prized against individualism. And that, I would say, is a bit more, it, it's, it's a very clear contrast between what we have here. Um, where it is, where we're a lot more individualistic, right? Um, we would kind of like, um, I mean, I wouldn't like it if we try, if anyone tried to justify, you know, uh, curtailing of civil liberties with the argument that, oh, this is to preserve social harmony. Um, so that would, I would say is the kind of major difference. What, uh, now, when, uh, when COVID hit, you were, um, uh, you were you were a, a critic of a lot of lockdown measures, and you know Singapore was one of the places that was held up as a model for how to deal with COVID. What was wrong about uh, Singapore's model, or or was it that it was it there was something fundamentally wrong with it as far as you were concerned, or it's that it's just fundamentally antithetical to how a free society should operate? I mean, you know, by all accounts, Singapore did very well. Um, and by well, um, they they did manage to keep the cases very low, except for like a flare up with um, low wage blue collar immigrant workers, which actually the root cause of that was stuffing them in these dormitories. And so it really did highlight the foreign worker plight in, in Singapore. Because Singapore, like a lot of countries and, you know, and arguably the United States as well, there are. 
there, you know, there is a group of people who don't, who weren't born there, who come there and labor there and do a lot of the grunt work and are kind of segregated out of regular society. And so in Singapore, these people don't have access to the same social welfare benefits or citizenship or anything. And a path to citizenship, unless maybe they married a local. Um, but yes, they really shine the spotlight on this kind of like two-tiered system, right? And on a parallel worlds where um, these workers actually, you know, have, you know, are paid really low wages. And and so it was good that it kind of sparked that conversation. And I think that it that, you know, what happened, it will improve their their um their prospects. But um by all accounts, other than that one blip, Singapore did, you know, perform really well by by all by most measures. And you know, they never really had to lock down schools the way we did. Um, but here is what happens if, if let's say I want or you wanted to travel to Singapore, you would have to be quarantined in an airport for two weeks. So they shut down the borders and it was a mandatory quarantine. Um, you would be tracked. And if you were found to have violated your, your quarantine as a American FedEx pilot discovered, he basically left his quarantine, I think half an hour earlier to pick up some drugs at the pharmacy before his flight back to the United States. He got arrested and he was jailed for two days. Um, the, you know, it's from our perspective, something like that would be ridiculous to jail somebody for breaking a quarantine half an hour early. We're not even enforcing our, our quarantines, right? So even domestic travel, we've not even been enforcing it. But, you know, in, the Singapore mindset has always been to um, uh, sort of uh, enact certain punishments to make an example out of people because these examples then become deterrents for other kinds of behavior. And um, it, in a way, that's actually a very kind of like tiger mom, Asian kind of mindset. Uh, we have to, you know, make an example out of you. And so I think that's why you had such harsh punishments. And then they also started creating these apps um, to allow tracking. And I think one of my criticisms of it was actually that, um, you know, they, the government basically said, don't worry, this app is just to, you know, track the spread of COVID. Um, but of course, it was used actually, in and some data was turned into the police who used it to arrest uh, two individuals. So it's the classic slippery slope um, kind of problem that we worry about came to fruition. Um, otherwise, you know, I think um, it's it's a totally different country with uh, very different ideals. And at the end of the day, they didn't have to shut down their schools. Um, businesses were actually open for a much longer time, um, and it it. It remains to be seen, you know, which which methods was, you know, better. <laughs> yeah, and it's also it's not clear that we had to shut down, right? I mean, large, you know, shutting down the schools seems to have been a complete waste of time and resources with uh, probably very long lived ramifications that we can barely begin to conceptualize for the moment. Um, so uh, you you uh, came over to the United States from Singapore in order to study, and you were studying genomics. Um, why did you come here, and um, has the country paid off for you in the way that you hoped it would? Um, I decided to come here because um, you know Singapore is always like obviously kind of a very socially repressive place. If you're a natural rebel, which I was. Um, it was, I, 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 ne I knew I needed to leave to at least um, live a, a portion of my life outside of the country. Um, and, you know, the United States for me was, was the first choice, obviously. It appealed to me because of, of some values that were in direct opposition to, you know, the, the values that I grew up with in Singapore. Um, the freedom of speech was very important. Um, I was so aware of, of these what we would call OB markers, out of balance markers. Um, and, you know, when you have a law that would penalize people for speech that could be, you know, that basically if you offend the religious feelings of a certain group, you could be jailed as, as has happened. Um, it, it really puts a damper on, on speech in the sense of self-censorship. So people do end up self-censoring and you just feel like there's this general sense of you're, you're walking on eggshells all the time. Um, yeah, but in one way, it's, it's just very clear. If you don't talk about race or criticize the government too much or talk about the legal system, you'll be fine. And, and you, know, you kind of knew that you just, as long as you didn't go there, 
you're okay. But it does have an overall effect on, on people. And um, I, I was always kind of a rebellious kid anyway. And, you know, coming to the United States was, was, a bit, was quite important to me. Um, and I imagine that, you know, in college, it would, you know, we'd be free to discuss anything. And, <laughs> and uh, of course, yeah, you I really thought, picked the wrong time to come to the United States. I, right? I picked the right time. By the time I graduated, it was 2009. So that was before. Um, it was really only later on, and I was actually working on campus at the time, um, that I started to see all the shenanigans. And, you know, that was like, I was probably one of the first ones to start speaking out about it because I could sense, I think people that live in countries where, where speech is repressed tend to have a particular sensitivity to it. It's like our antenna, like, oops, something's wrong. You have the kids here who, these are supposed to be your educated class. They're going to be the elites of your entire cohort. And they're the ones clamoring for censorship. They're the ones displaying this uber sensitivity to everything. I wanted to shut, you know, shut speech down, disinvite speakers. And that's when I, I, I realized like something is wrong with America, but in speaking out, you know, one of the one of the pushbacks that I got was, he, this is confined to this is just fringe. Don't worry, it's a phase. They're just crazy college students. This will never survive contact with reality after they graduate. Uh, six years into it, right? So maybe this is like 2014. Um, you know that that was wrong. Yeah. Um, okay. So two questions. And first, um, you know, you said you were kind of a born rebel or individualist or whatever. Do you think it's really temperamental like that? Or were there particular um, experiences or books that you read? Because we're going to talk about Ideas Beyond Borders, which translates books, uh, kind of Western Enlightenment type books, uh, secular books into Arabic and then distributes them in, in the Arab speaking world. Um, so you're exporting your troublemaking uh, even more than you uh, might have been just by walking around Singapore. But, you know, was, is, it, is it really just a kind of temperament or is it something that you think was learned uh, by you from either the things you read or the experiences you had? Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it's a, it's a, it's a mix of all things. Um, but, you know, I, I grew up into a very, um, I guess my, my mom was Methodist. And so I was sent to, you know, Protestant schools my whole life and very active. She was very active in church. Um, and I definitely remember questioning a lot of the uh, Sunday school teachers, you know, um, even when I was six or seven to the point that I had to get out of class. Um, and other kids who grew up, you know, in the same social milieu um, would just sit there and just kind of go along with it. Um, I never really could get into religion and I tried. And I knew that speaking up was a bit of a, you know, it's a, it's a kind of culture where, where even just asking questions was frowned upon because, you know, part of Confucian values is there's hierarchy. You should always respect your teacher and, and information flow is top down, not bottom up. And, and that's one of the bigger contrasts with America. When I, when I came here for college, I'm like, you mean you can talk back <laughs> to the professor? You mean this is a discussion? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it was mind blowing. It just was a total culture shock. Um, you mean I can call the professor by his first name? I didn't have to like, you know, sir or madam. It's it's such a different. Um, unless it's Dr. Jill Biden, you know, you, oh, you can just call them Jill or, you know, Bill or whatever. Um, you know, it's fascinating to think about, uh, you know, introducing uh, Protestantism, Protestant Christianity into an Asian culture or, in, you know, into a Catholic culture in Europe in the, you know, in the uh, 17th uh, you know, uh, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, where there's such a, um, uh, you know, premium in Protestant theology and in individual experience, individual interpretation, um, you know, that it, it seems like a bad idea to, um, you know, be, uh, you know, introducing Christianity into Asian settings if, if what you want is to maintain hierarchy. Actually, is doing so well. So, you know, the, the country with the largest number in proportion wise of Christians is actually going to be China in the mix by 2025. Um, look at mega churches in Korea. You know, it's it's huge in Asia. Christianity is booming there and is booming as it is on the decline um, here in the West in general. What explains that? Is it, uh, you know, that they, you know, that it's actually true and people are going to be, you know, they're banking on being saved or what is appealing about Christianity in, you know, communist China? 
Um, I, no, I, it's not really necessarily communist China. I think uh, culturally, you know, the um, sort of, I think both Christianity and, and values, like Asian values, which I, I really don't like that term, um, uh, they, there's something that goes kind of hand in hand, this like uh, work ethic, Christian ethic, um, the uh, very sim the simplicity of, of seeing the world, you know, with like good and evil and salvation, it's, it appeals to the Asian mindset very much. Um, and then also Christianity is very focused on, on new, um, the nuclear family and, and social conservatism. And Asians are social conservatives, um, you know, and it's one of the, the reasons why um, many of them, you know, are vote for Republicans. So my other question was, when you started to encounter in an American context, students being the ones who were saying like, hey, you know, don't ask questions or don't don't make statements that are kind of upsetting to people. Where do you think that's coming from? Um, because, you know, it used to be the idea is that you would go to college and, you know, this is mythologized and romanticized, but, but the idea was you would go to college in order to be offended or to be exposed to things that you couldn't possibly believe are true. And you would have long late night conversations, you know, arguing about everything. Um, and that seems to not be, you know, what the dream is anymore. What, you know, what what's going on with a new kind of um, repression on campuses? I, I quite fully buy into George Lukanoff's work uh, and Jonathan Haidt with uh, Coddling of the American Mind. Um, and I think this concept of, of safetyism is really coming from the kind of, of uh, parenting for, for a few decades that have led up to this point. So you're indicting me and my parenting, point taken. You know, I offer no defense, but... Yeah. I mean, think about how different America would be if, if we were all brought up by Amy Chua. <laughs> we would be able to take a lot. Um, it's, you know... Okay, maybe that was extreme, but but there is a sense that that kind of parenting is not really inculcating a sense of resilience, emotional resilience to things, um, and and we're so you know we're, we're creating a generation that that's just used to having their feelings validated all the time. You could be anything, participation trophy for you, um, you know, and and in fact that you know in part that's a bit of a, a lie, right? Like we tell these kids all the time. You can be anything you want and it's great it's in fact i mean you know liberalism was great coming from a conservative society where you know you're told no you can't be anything you want it's not you do you you know basically your path available to you is pretty constrained if if not singapore itself in a lot of countries where it's like at a certain age you take an exam and if you don't make a certain score then you know whole swaths of the future are just blocked off to you i mean that's a terrible world to live in terrible. isn't it it's yeah. terrible. I, I fully believe it's terrible, but there is a dark side to the American method, I think, and, and we're starting to, to feel it. I, you know, I, a lot of kids are not given that dose of reality. They're, you know, if, you, if you're told for your whole life that you be anything, by the time you hit college and your options start dwindling, you start to see your own limitations, um, all of a sudden it hits you. You're like, wait a minute, maybe I can't do anything. And, and that, you know, dissidence that that existential crisis it creates is um it, it can be pretty damaging hmm. so uh let's talk about ideas beyond borders the organization you co-founded with uh faisal matar uh matar um what is ideas beyond borders and uh, why why does why is it necessary to to exist um you know it's a organization that you know, my co-founder who is from Iraq, um, we, we started uh, to really fill a, a role. We wanted to plug uh, a, a gap in, in knowledge and expose, um, you know, people that speak Arabic um, to ideas that, that were just not really available in that language, um, mostly because, you know, a lot of these books are just not translated. Um, and and the translations are hard. They're not economically feasible. The bookmark book markets, publishing markets in most in most Arabic countries, uh, Arabic speaking countries, are actually not robust. Um, I always give this statistic just to, just for people that have an idea. A New York Times bestseller here in the United States, you would need to sell about five thousand copies in one week. Um, an Arab bestseller will be you know a book that sells five thousand copies in an entire year. So. 
and and uh, we wanted to kind of change that. Um, there were a lot of books that we thought should exist in Arabic that we should you know have people access be, you know be given free access to. Um, that were ideas about uh, books about the Enlightenment. Um, you know, we actually just did uh, translating um, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, the graphic novel, into Arabic. Um, you know, we've done, we're doing science books, books about philosophy, um, just to kind of reignite this um, uh, culture of reading. There was a time when when the Arabic speaking world was actually, you know, very pluralistic. Scholars used to go there. There were libraries everywhere. and it's changed, um, you know, and, and it never really bounced is back. Is that mostly, is that, is that largely, in your understanding, is that largely a function of uh, political ideology merging with religion? Or I, I know that you guys focus some attention on the idea of secularism um, as something that has gone missing. But it's also, I, I was talking to um, a woman who I guess was Syrian and was talking about how... Um, in the 60s, you know, women were wearing mini skirts and going to university. In many ways, it was as or more advanced in many parts of the Arab world than, you know, than the West. So is it is it simply um, Islam or is it also Islam plus kind of nationalism or pan-national? Definitely the latter. I, I think uh, Islam was co-opted in a way um, to shore up power. You know, I mean, Saddam, everyone, you know, people are like, oh, Saddam was a secular guy, you know, uh, and and kind of pit him against Al Qaeda, contrasted him with Al Qaeda and ISIS, who are explicitly religious fanatics. But Saddam used religion. Saddam co-opted it um, to shore up power. And in fact, by, you know, killing all the moderates, killing all the liberals, he created a vacuum for these Islamist groups to thrive. And he you know, just like them, didn't tolerate, there was no, you know, toleration of dissent, uh, toleration of, of minorities of different viewpoints. So it, it, they were kind of a manifestation of, of the same intolerance. What are, what's, uh, you know, how many people have you reached or how, how do you measure the reach of ideas beyond borders? Um, and generally you translate the books and I, I know I've talked to Faisal about this. I mean, it's, it's, pretty stunning and inspiring. You get, you know, people generally who live in that part of the world to translate books at, you know, real personal risk if they're unmasked. But then you circulate them as PDFs or as Mobi files and things like that. But what's, you know, what's the, what's, a, what's a hit for you or what is the reach of your operation? Um, so a book like Steven Pinker's initially, like Enlightenment Now, it's a very thick book. So that took a long time to translate. Um, a book like his got 12,000 downloads in the first six months, just from our website alone, and that's what we can track. Um, but in the Middle East, books are actually shared a lot um, via Telegram. So there are these big channels where you have almost a black market of books. And so you would have something like Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion About Atheism, translated into Arabic and shared in these Telegram channels. Now, once it's in Telegram, we can't track it. So we don't know how far these books really go. And frankly, we don't care. The whole idea is to get it far and wide. Um, I would say we pivoted to Wikipedia also because, you know, if when you're translating Wikipedia, th this is all common licensing. So we didn't have to worry about uh, one of the major bottlenecks of this entire process is negotiating with publishers and the copyright holders, getting the contracts. I mean, it, there was a point when Faisal and I were thinking to ourselves, why hadn't this been done before? You know, it was a slam dunk idea, like obviously it has to be done. <laughs> well, there's always a reason why it hasn't been done before. Um, you're not, you're never the first person to think about something. Uh, and and it's because it was hard and it was hard to negotiate for this rights. Um, it took and a it's, long time. It's kind of stunning though, people like Steven Pinker and Sam Harris and others, I guess Dawkins as well, kind of gave you the rights in Arabic. Right. Yeah. To, I mean, and, and I guess in a way it's like the, the market is so small. It's, you know, in a way it's, you know, it's easy to be generous with them. But it, it's pretty stunning that they were just like, yeah, take them and do that. Exactly. They were very generous of them. And of course, they could, there, there is some royalties to be made. I, I will say, though, that one of the most stunning turnarounds was actually uh, a few publishers at the Baghdad Book Fair approached us and said they actually wanted to, uh, you know, publish in print. Sam Har two of Sam Harris's books and one of Stephen Pinker's books. And we were actually surprised because 
you know, for a publisher to display such a book and have this book as, as on their shelves, it, it's a very big undertaking. And the fact that we actually, you know, we're moving from the digital world to getting printed copies of these books being sold in the country. I'm like, this is the kind of change that we were hoping to see. And um, it's it was it's very heartening, um, you know, and, and like you mentioned, the translators that work for us, we have 120 of them all across, you know, from Syria to Jordan to Egypt. Um, these people are so inspiring. They're mostly very young, un university educated, um, and they're very interested in science. Um, one of our translators who's been targeted the most works a lot on evolution, and, and that is a very controversial topic. Um, he got some uh, hit. Thankfully, it's life. settled dogma in the United States, right? I mean, at least several of the Republican presidential candidates say they believe in evolution. So, you know, we're making real progress. Well, that's not a lightning rod anymore. You know, we <laughs> yeah. to be having these debates about teach the controversy, teach, you know, and th that seems to have all faded away. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you've written a lot about, uh, you know, or as, as we're talking about all sorts of things, you know, and there's horrific violent crime in the United States and there's a kind of shutdown of certain types of speech, uh, you know, what's permissible in, a, you know, in public spaces. Uh, in another way, you know, it's also true that, you know, we live in the golden age of speech and expression. Everybody can say whatever the hell they want, which is great. But then you've written about um, Hong Kong, uh, you know, which is still you know, uh, fighting, you know, with with uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Are you um, optimistic about the Middle East, about the Arab speaking Middle East? Are you uh, optimistic about China and the way that it is dealing with places like Hong Kong, as well as the countries in its most obvious sphere of influence? Um, or do you think, you know, the world is becoming darker? If, if I kind of focus just on, you know, what I what I see with the trends of the youth and everything in the Middle East, it seems optimistic. Um, many of them have seen, you know, rotation. They, they've seen secular, you know, dictators, um, authoritarian governments. They've seen the their societies collapse, terrorism, um, Islamist groups. So many young Arabs actually reject all of this. They're almost, you know, I, I think this is a breeding ground for libertarians, <laughs> the entire region. I, I thought you were going to say they're nihilists and hence uh, natural libertarians. But no, but I mean, so they're kind of post um, totalizing ideologies at this point, whether it's a secular tyranny or a religious tyranny. Yeah, because all of them have brought, you know, have brought nothing and, and just death and, and chaos to their countries. Um, and uh, but my my main concern is actually uh, the rise of you know uh, an authoritarian ethno state that that is a lot, that is exporting their censorship apparatus. They're exporting it to the Middle East. Um, that you know China has also begun putting out um, their state uh, state television, CGN TV, uh, Sinhua News Agency has. Uh, both of these outlets have Arabic channels where you have like, um, you know, an Asian girl, like speaking perfect Arabic, perfect accent. Um, and, you know, during COVID, uh, a lot of these channels were actually spreading misinformation. There was, they were spreading ideas about um, this virus having been invented by the CIA or in a, in a U.S. lab and being released in China. Here's the proof. Um, and uh, so you have, you know, the, China basically winning these Arab countries over also by soft diplomacy, um, by uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, I think it was very telling that majority Muslim countries in the Arab world did not sign the letter condemning China to the United Nations um, for their treatment of the Muslims, the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. And again, that has all to do with with market access and you know the the quid pro quo that that China has um, provided these countries in the form of infrastructure. Um, you know they've signed deals with Saudi Arabia um, for you know infrastructure spending and things like that. So it's it's very worrying. Uh, you have uh, written and spoken about the way that China is corrupting Hollywood or, or you know, U.S. based entertainment um, companies. Can you talk about, you know, what what forms is that taking? I think 
all of us were familiar with the the kind of brouhaha over the live action version of Mulan, uh, where it was you know a cast of thousands kind of, and it's like yeah, it's Uyghurs in concentration camps. But um, uh, can you talk a little bit about your uh, you know what what the Chinese government is doing and why it concerns you? Um, you know, there've been quite a few movies that that it, it, it that it has impacted um, almost. There are almost no Hollywood movies today, major productions that that are not financed by China. There was a certain point, I think, if you look at the James Bond films, um, there was one with the movies that uh, featured uh, North Koreans as um, the enemy. I can't remember, one of the Pierce Brosnan ones. That was actually supposed to have been China, like Chinese individuals where, where, you know, where the general was like uh, the enemy that James Bond had tried to um, uh, to take down. Um, but China was able to pressure uh, the rewriting of the scripts to, you know, instead have it be a North Korean general instead. So they've actively um, gone in to, you know, if Tibet was an issue, uh, you know, to erase that. So if, if the script called for a Tibetan monk, in, as it did in Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, um, yeah. By the way, an actual medical doctor, not a PhD. Uh, just Doctor Strange. Like just like you, actually. Uh, well, no, I am. Uh, I am a PhD, but not a medical doctor. And so, my, when I offer medical advice, really don't take it. But yes. Yeah, so, and I mean, what 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 is the solution, or what you know, what kind of what is your solution to that? Because on a certain level, what Hollywood is doing, you know, Hollywood is a shorthand for this, because it also extends to the NBA. Uh, you know, where you uh, you know, within the same week, you might have somebody like LeBron James, you know, talking about, uh, you know, rightly criticizing certain types of police tactics in the United States, but then shutting down fellow players for daring to say anything bad about China. Um, you know what? You know, what is the right way to do that? Because on a certain level, these giant corporations, whether it's a movie studio or a, uh, you know, a, a sports league, they're just going where the money is, right? Right. I, I mean, I, I think there's a difference between, you know, companies that are involved in the national security infrastructure. Um, for, for those companies, anybody that's providing some sort of electronics to, say, the electrical grid, yeah, I think we have to be very careful about about working with any any company related, you know, that has relationships with China. Chinese companies do not have any separation. There's there's this thing called a civil military fusion. Um, every company has to have a on their board um, a member of the Communist Party. So it's not like in the United States where there is actually a wall of separation between industry and the state. In in China, they are one and the same. So any you know node that passes through uh, China, if your company's hosting a server there, you can almost bet your you know, entire company's assets uh, that on the fact that you will be spied on. Um, and so I think the policies regarding these kinds of you know, companies are very different than entertainment, uh, than the NBA, where we, we can't stop this from happening. There's there's no law, you know, that, that it, this is not something that we, we can pass by legislation. But I do think that people speaking up about it, people pointing out the hypocrisy, at some point it has to be so obvious that that you cannot take this public position because it is simply embarrassing. Um, and so, you know, there, there are some, you know, liberal talk show hosts that, that have been highlighting this. Bill Maher is a very good example of one. Um, and uh, the more this kind of penetrates the public consciousness, organizers, we need to have people that, um, you know, bring together uh, people in Hollywood, directors, whatever, to talk about the problems they're facing with, um, you know, people who, journalists who study this problem, who know exactly what's going in Xinjiang, um, and, and kind of bring them together to, to talk. Because I think a big part of this is, you know, for a long time, I think it was naivete. It was just, you can make money, we can all make money, we can get rich together, China will change. Clearly that, you know, the opposite has happened. China is not only not changing, but they are changing us. So, um, yeah, can we talk about that a little bit? Because yeah, there was, there was that moment, and I'm thinking back to like the early YouTube days when, you know, you would see videos, and this was kind of a paradigmatic YouTube video, and it made, you know, I think about it, I, I kind of choke up a little bit, but it would be, Chinese kids singing or lip syncing Backstreet Boy songs wearing Kobe Bryant Lakers jerseys. And it was like, OK, you know what? Um, America or the West has tried, you know, military power and that's come a cropper. It's just, you know, destroyed all sorts of things, including 
uh, the economies of, of the West and that, you know, we were all going to be able to communicate, you know, uh, through uh, shared entertainment and culture and, and things like that. Um, that has really kind of disappeared. And we now, you know, seem to be in a place where it's like, no, it's just, you know, one one uh, popular line of thought is, you know, that China is just becoming is rising and is dominant. Milton Friedman back in the 70s and um, in his 1980 uh, miniseries uh, for PBS Free to Choose talked a lot about how, um, you know, he believed that economic freedom, um, you know, allowed when if you if it gave people economic freedom, they became richer when they became richer. They started to demand political freedom. Um, and then as the 80s unfolded, he seemed to be absolutely right that what was happening in China, you know, the after Mao died, the economy was liberalized. People got wealthier. The Tiananmen Square, the democracy movement, uh, you know, kind of rose and then it was crushed. Um, do you think he was hopelessly naive that a rising standard of living um, is ultimately going to force a political, uh, uh, you know, a kind of political freedom that is now maybe unimaginable in China? Or, um, you know, or is it just that his timeline was off and that it, it'll come down the road? It's funny because I, I remember this narrative and obviously it's reinforced by, uh, you know, the end of history. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. They're all part of the same kind of big story. Yes. But the reason I never bought it was because I was from a country that proved that that was wrong, right? Singapore went through, was one of the first Asian tigers. And, you know, it went from, it went to first world in like a, a few decades. Um, and I remember, uh, you know, by, by most accounts, Singapore was doing very well on GDP per capita. People were surprised at this country and how it really punched above its weight. It was by all accounts, a very prosperous nation. And it got there in a very you know, quick amount of time. Well, I didn't notice that people were, um, dec were, were demanding for more political freedoms. They were actually very satisfied. And it's one of the things that bothered me about living there. You know, um, I was very bothered by the fact that it was 2010 and we still didn't have gay rights. We still had the on the books a, a part of the law that criminalizes homosexuality on the books. And and I could see that people were very happy with the government and realized that if, as long as it was prosperous, as long as their, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs were met, most people didn't need the self-actualization. Most people didn't need that at all. And, you know, the Gulf states also were kind of going down the same route where they were getting very wealthy, um, mostly oil money, sovereign wealth funds were swelling, but people weren't trying to change and, and call for change in terms of more political rights, um, you know, liberalization of social norms, they were kind of static. And so I, I kind of had a sense something was wrong with that, that thesis. But, you know, the one thing that um, I kind of think that was, it's unfair to judge uh, uh, Milton Friedman for is in China's case, it's not a really fair assessment because China never really had a two way street in terms of communication. So they had this big firewall and as they grew, um, they were able to keep their own population in the dark. Now, if, if those walls were, were taken down, if, if, you know, we could, if the average Chinese person could read everything about the world from the comforts of their own home and learn about the world that way, maybe they would have made, you know, they would have actually demanded for more political freedoms. Well, do you think it's likely, I mean, is it likely that the, you know, Chinese government will really be able to maintain, you know, a strict kind of firewall or, you know, is is it already happening that, you know, th this you, you just can't keep the world out for too long, especially the more you trade with it, even if it's under very constrained circumstances? That's what we thought. Right. But the way technology has gone is, is actually it's, it's reinforcing the surveillance state. It's actually shoring up their authoritarian power in a way that's almost unprecedented. Um, you know, that there's an amazing article, The Atlantic, uh, the Panopticon is already here, about how they're deploying that in Xinjiang. And whatever you're seeing in Xinjiang, you know that's going to be um, deployed for the rest of the country. The social and so credit system. This is system, the, this the is... broad social credit system where everything you do kind of gets tracked. And it may be, I mean, there may be a state version of that and there may be a kind of private sector version of that coming in America. You've written uh, one of the stories that you wrote for Spectator USA 
um, was about how um, um, uh, Yelp is starting to add certain elements of, of a kind of social credit system to it, right? Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I, I think that was uh, with regard. I can't remember what the what the story was about. Like the it was actual- it was about um, like race racist um, uh, or racially charged behavior was noted at a restaurant or something like that that they yes. had a tag. Yes, and 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 there have been a few cases of this nationally where um, you know a owner an owner. I think you know one in one case it was a. Um, a white woman who started a Chinese restaurant and she uh, declared that this was like a healthy version of Chinese food, you know, clean, she used the word clean eating in her Instagram post to promote the restaurant. And, and people jumped on that and said, wait, are you saying that Chinese food is dirty? You, you know, you, you're, you must be racist. And anyway, a white woman starting a Chinese restaurant is problematic or something to that of that sort. Um, and so she, you know, the, the review system, Yelp review systems were actually weaponized. Um, it became uh, a, a frontier for for the people accusing her racism, and 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 um, you know when Yelp starts saying as a policy we're going to actually note when a restaurant has been accused of racism, um, this is like saying all right we're just going to have profiles for everybody, we're going to note when somebody is accused of me too accused, and just have that label in their profile and it's going to stick. Um, what could go wrong? I mean, this is, you know, mob rush to judgment on steroids and it's going to follow you. I mean, Europe is slightly better at this. I think they have things like the right to be forgotten and they, they care a little bit more about privacy. Um, but Although they also care a lot more about controlling expression, right? So that certain kinds of uh, thoughts uh, or words are verboten. You can't buy and sell certain things. Uh, as as a final point, uh, and I'm going to mangle the uh, the pronunciation because I think it's Latin. And even though I took two years of Latin in high school, I have no idea how to sp- uh, pronounce it. Uh, on your Twitter feed, which is uh, Ms. Mel Chen, and there'll be links to uh, this at the Reason page for those who are listening. You uh, have a slogan that is. Caper Aude, uh, C A P E R E A U D E. Do you remember what that is and why is that important? Yes, um, my Latin is also bad, but thankfully, uh, you know that's it's not a microaggression to mispronounce Latin. Um, yeah, not anymore, right? Because <laughs> Italians, Italians kind of became white a long, you know, about you know when Joe DiMaggio went hit in fifty six games in a row, uh, Italians became white. Except for the New Jersey one, like you that's know, so yeah, they're, they're the worst. They're garbage. Yes. So what does capere aude mean? Up or? here, I think it's up here. Uh, S A D R E. Um, it translates to dare to know, and it's uh was kind of seen as the motto of the Enlightenment period. Um, and I've always kind of identified with that phrase because, um, you know the idea about daring to know something, know something that is forbidden, know something that is, um, you know, knowledge that was kept because at the time during the enlightenment, it was controlled by the church and the church was the one censoring um, all other publications and poor Voltaire had to be exiled. Um, And you had to meet in these secret salons to discuss ideas and, you know, the entire encyclopedia by um, uh, Diderot was published in secret. and I've always identified with that because I think, um, you know, like this idea that uh, right now we, we're kind of living in that culture again, where where we're, you know, there are certain certain ideas that we're not allowed to kind of talk about in public, not because of government censorship, but because, um, you know, of certain social mores, like questioning certain ideas, um, maybe even putting out data. You know, we you have people fired for just quoting statistics that were coming out from academic journals. Um, and you know, it's not about, it's not about knowing all the answers, right? It's the, the most important thing in life is knowing that you can ask questions that lead to the answers. And we now live in a time where even questions cannot really be asked comfortably about certain topics. Um, and so I kind of like use that phrase to, to remind myself of, of not, you know, don't be afraid, don't be afraid to ask because having all the questions is actually more important than having all the answers. 
All right, that's a great note to end on. We're going to leave it here. We've been talking with Melissa Chen. She's the Managing Director of Ideas Beyond Borders. She's a columnist at The Spectator USA, and you can find her on Twitter, uh, Clubhouse, and virtually every social media platform. Uh, Melissa, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you, Nick.